<laughs> kick off our dis I'm sorry. Um, my bad. Uh, to kick off today's discussion, um, I just wanted to ask, because I really don't remember, in uh, her defense slash prosecution yesterday, yesterday, last week, did um, did Grace mention an illness? Did you did you ever? I guess the defense probably would have bring that up. Um, did did we or um, ever bring up an illness, or was an illness ever discussed? Yes, we yes. discussed bipolar disorder. We did. Okay. All right. So, um, Not like formally, but like it was brought up that some of her behavior would be consistent with that diagnosis. Gotcha. So, I mean, obviously, today, I think today's discussion certainly is going to link to that. And I, I guess this group today will determine whether or not uh, that quote unquote expert witness last week was in fact correct, if if that if that were the case, right? All right, so I mean, um, usually we take a consensus of who we would like to focus on, uh, but I think um, number one, because of this movie and number two, because of the discussion last week, um, this group needs to focus on the the character of, of Annie Wilkes. Um, and then from that point, the first step really would be to simply describe what you saw. So um, try not to get ahead of ourselves with regard to instantly labeling and to some extent even avoid medical jargon. Um, what is it that caught your eye or interest? So she, she seems like very ha happy and cheerful um in sort of like a strange way she's almost like too happy going off of zach's point i think that's what and kathy bates played this brilliantly right like the way that she was you know when, she, when you when you when you first meet her and most people know a little bit about misery even before they see the movie at this point but you first meet her and you think oh she's a you know nice lady or she, or she seems it like that's her you know and it, it seems genuine and then all of a sudden she goes from zero to 180 so quickly Yes, she does. So, I mean, that allows us to backtrack ju just a second and, and talk about affect um, and, and the five different uh, different spheres. So it's probably worthwhile reviewing those, um, uh, especially since you're going to be teaching the medical students what these what, what these are. So, the the five different domains of affect for the PGY ones. Um, what's what's on your list? Intensity. So intensity, okay. Um, can someone else give us some um, clinical terms to describe intensity? Anyone? High intensity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Th th there's really not an arbitrarily agreed upon word to describe high intensity. So that that's perfectly accurate. Um, nor is there a word to describe normalcy. Um, so the individual had adequate intensity, normal intensity is fine. Uh, the, the two clinical terms that you really do have to know are those that describe um, below average intensity. Anybody have any guesses here? Diminished? So below, or, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh, it was diminished, is that it? Or? Um, you wouldn't be wrong, it, it's usually blunted. Right. And well below average or significantly below average would be flat. Right. So those those are the two more common clinical terms. And there really isn't clear differentiation um, between blunted and flat. That's going to be in the eye of the beholder. Right. So um, but again, arbitrarily um, speaking, we do actually agree that um, a flat affect is quote unquote worse than a blunted affect. All right, that's intensity. Anybody, uh, any other PGY-1 have another domain of, of affect? PGY-2. Range. Good, range. Um, somebody else, some relative clinical terms for range. Intricate. 
sorry, I missed that one. Full range. Full, right? Full or, or broad. Uh, I think those two terms are interchangeable. Constricted. Constricted. Constricted, good. Yeah. Yeah, so what you're looking at here are the highs and the lows. And the individual should actually show peaks and valleys, peaks and troughs with regard to a plotted intensity over time, over the one hour of a psychiatric evaluation. Um, if those peaks are not that much different from those troughs, that is considered to be a constricted or restricted range. I've heard both terms used, they seem to be interchangeable, right? Constricted, restricted. Of course, if the area under the curve, if you're plotting the peak and the trough is normal, that's considered to be uh, full or broad. Uh, again, those two terms, I, two, two terms are interchangeable as well. That's range. Another PGY1 for another domain. Second year. Um, whether it's congruent with the mood they're stating to you. Yep. And again, this, this one's fairly straightforward. Um, it's either congruent or incongruent. Uh, you may hear the word appropriate or inappropriate. Again, that's interchangeable. Sounds a little bit more politically incorrect, but congruence and appropriateness are the same. Um, what is the clinical term reserved for a, an incongruent affect in the setting of conversion disorder? La Belle and De France. Perfect. Right. So if you were taking a prate, if you were taking a board certifying exam and an individual presented with acute right eye blindness for which no underlying physical cause can be found, and the diagnosis was conversion disorder, and the question stem asked to describe the individual's affect and how calm they were in reporting their rapid onset symptoms. If choice A were incongruent and choice D were labella and deference, it's choice D that actually be the better answer. Right? So that's in single best. You would not be wrong with regard to choice A. Right? Another domain. Could you say like the quality of the affect, like euthymic or dysthymic affect? Yep. Right here again, it's not a time and please really this to the medical students. It is not a time to impress the resident or the attending with, with regard to your vocabulary. Um, keep it simple. Certainly the more common terms here are euthymic, uh, dysphoric, anxious and irritable, right? Those are, I think the 4 most common adjectives, right? And then 1 more. Is like, um, lability the last 1, like, whether or not the affect is stable or not. Good, exactly right. So it's change pattern. Um, an abnormally slow change pattern would be over controlled. And an abnormally rapid change pattern would be labile. Right? And that brings us right back to Annie. Uh, she has a labile affect. Um, she also, I think, has a broad affect as well as an irritable affect. Right? Those you, you can use more than one term because there are five domains. All right? So, all right, good. What else did you say? That was it. Everything else was normal for Annie Wilkes. You guys are okay with this? Well, her weird sort of like when she had, especially what was pronounced at the beginning, she had, remember what her first outburst? And then afterwards, she's like, she goes, I'm so sorry. I really, I don't know what comes over me. Did you guys know that too? That That's kind of what stood out to me. And that was almost, I feel like that could make the defense, I feel like, would make that argument. Like, she's not even in, she know, like, she feels guilty afterwards, or, she, but she can't control herself in that moment. She says she gets worked up. That's what I wrote down. She yeah. gets worked <laughs> up. And she's sorry about it. Do you think that um, when she does get worked up, it's an excess of one would expect for, given the stressor? I think it's fair. Right? So there's some, and I mean, the clinical term we would use here is that there appears to be some intermittent explosiveness. The clinical term explosive is when it's out of, um, out of the degree of the stressor. Right? And of course, 
intermittent explosive disorder is when that becomes re uh, recurrent and clinically significant, which I guess in terms of what um, everybody here is describing would need to be in a differential diagnosis, right? Having said that though, uh, it's also important to note that in the DSM, and unfortunately the, the DSM-5 shed this, and it's unfortunate because the DSM-4, I think, was more well-written with regard to this condition. Um, intermittent explosive disorder was actually in a chapter called the um, impulse control disorders, not elsewhere classified or NEC. And the title of the chapter itself reminded the clinician that the intermittent and explosive behavior could not be in the context of another mental disorder. So if we're discussing this may be a case of bipolar, it is true that Annie is identified as having uh, intermittent explosiveness, but we're, we still have to focus on the nature of our conversation. And that is about bipolar and the intermittent explosive disorder really would fall down lower in our differential. That's just a reminder. So not elsewhere classified. And this group seems to, um, at least yes, uh, yesterday, I keep saying yesterday, last week um, classified her behavior as part of a bipolar spectrum. Right? But again, we'll get there. We'll see if that's really true. All right, so you've gotten all these um, wonderful observations with regard to um, uh, our main character, our patient. Um, one quick tangent, because I did want to bring this up and I don't want to forget about this. Um, has anybody seen misery prior to their residency? No. Nope. Oh my gosh. Really? All right. <laughs> so, um, what, one of the observations that I, I think is somewhat compelling is that for those who have seen this movie prior to their residency, and it's irrespective of what residency you go into, and then rewatch it in their PGY1 or PGY2 year, like everybody in this group has. Um, I would I would have loved to solicit the feedback on your impressions of Annie. That is, if you've seen this movie before, the normal person would know exactly what they're getting into, and you'd have you know preconceived um, conclusions with regard to your expectations, right? Uh, what she's going to do and how you feel about her behavior, and therefore about Annie Wilkes. Um, residents are a unique demographic. Um, they work very closely with nurses, so there's a, there's a um, I think, a conflictual prejudice that you, you, you adore, perhaps just like nursing. And, you know, in some cases, you know, you have these two uh, prejudices just collide with misery, that some people, after they've watched this movie dozens of times, still begin the movie liking Annie Wilkes, despite the fact they know exactly what's in store. Uh, but nobody here has seen the movie prior to the residency, so I can't, um, you know, <sighs> that's true. <laughs> some people, some people have had different experiences with nurses, but I think the Gestalt is, is one that's positive. All right. Um, so uh, that's a tangent we won't go down or explore. Um, choice A, is this a mood anxiety issue or is this a choice B, psychotic Dissociative. Now, again, I don't want you to think of the single best answer and then go back to one of these two categories and fit it in. Um, I want you to think along the lines of us having 99 undergraduates at Rutgers University here that are going to choose A or B. And with regards to their having seen the film, in regards of you having explained what you saw that was interesting, what would the consensus of that um, let's call it uneducated group, right? Because sometimes residents are just too educated for their own good. What would their consensus be? Mood. You want to go with choice A? Um, mood slash anxiety spectrum. Uh, okay. Um, if that's the case, which single illness will you now choose to work from? Major depressive disorder. It's always going to be major depressive disorder, right? Again, that's uh, that that's didactic specific. That's exercise specific. That is not movie centric. All right. So um, I'm not going to insult you and have you review the signs and the symptoms of major depression, Siggy caps. I'm going to just ask whether or not you believe 
given those inclusion criteria, Annie Wilkes um, is depressed. Now, remember, um, again, a quick caveat here. Let's treat this like a test question, right? So everybody here is, is raised and weaned on the board. Um, if the board exam were to give you four discrete depressive criteria and the single, um, I'm sorry, the, the four answers provided were major depression, um, panic disorder, schizophrenia, and somatoform disorder. Um, nobody here would leave that question blank, identifying that you need five criteria, not four, right? The single best answer would still be major depression. And I want you to treat the film the same way. Uh, Stephen King is far from a doctor. I mean, and, and quite frankly, uh, I actually read uh, the physician that he consults with that inform his novels. Um, I don't think much of Dr. Dorr either, right? So um, that, that aside, um, we're going to give him a major loophole here with regard to knowing the threshold of, in this case, five required to rule in depression. Do you think Annie's depressed? No. Anybody else? Um, I'm not sure if she meets like the duration that is required because she seems to be depressed. Like they show when it rains, she's depressed, but I don't know that it's ever been like that long or either it's tough to tell from the movie exactly how long she's depressed for. So uh, if you wouldn't mind me maybe putting your words in your mouth, Daniela, um, am I hearing that you believe she is depressed, but as a clinician, you would want to inquire about the duration of her current episode? Yes, that's right. <laughs> I, think, I think that's fair. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, she endorses suicidal ideation when she finds out that Paul isn't in love with her to the extent that she mm -hmm. loves him. Um, and I guess her, she does report insomnia, so her sleep is affected, but I don't think she meets the full five criteria. Oh, and, and, and I agree, and, but we already, we already agreed as a group that we're not going to be held to that standard. Uh, again, we're going to treat this more like a, a board exam and look at this as a single best answer. So, um, with this level of ambiguity, which, by the way, does parallel uh, a real patient encounter, um, let's investigate depression. Um, and even before we get to potential duration or additional symptoms, we have to first appreciate that this condition is a diagnosis of exclusion. So, now you're going to tell me the illnesses that the clinician has to investigate and rule out in order to continue our case formulation. Uh, PGY ones. Hypothyroidism. Right. So uh, we uh, we have to investigate for any underlying medical condition that would explain our patient symptoms, and certainly hypothyroidism is at the top of that list. But we're going to say medical conditions in general. Mm -hmm. Other uh, drug or toxin. Right. This 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 cannot be a substance induced uh, mood disorder. And number three? Yes, primary psych psychotic disorder. Um, before that? Bipolar disorder. Yeah, bipolar. Okay, bipolar. So, um, is there discrete evidence in this film, if you nerded out and looked at the script, that Annie is suffering from a substance induced, actually, let's say a substance use disorder. That's the first step here with regard to investigating a substance induced mood disorder is to establish a substance use disorder. Is that part of the script? So, I mean, my only thought about that was that she, she has these pain pills, like, like, why does she have those just in general? So, like, like maybe she's abusing those, but I don't think there's there's discrete evidence of her abusing substances. She has wine like one time, and she says she's like not not really a drinker. So I would say there's overall not discrete evidence. I agree, and I agree with your second comment as well because that's the second question, and that is if the answer is no, there's no discrete evidence. The follow-up question to that is, should that then reassure the clinician? that misery isn't a case study of a mood disorder secondary to substance use? And the answer is no, the clinician should not be reassured. Um, number one, 
because we should never be reassured upon our initial evaluation that substances aren't playing a central role. That's number one. And number two, in addition to that, uh, she is a nurse. So even though she's semi-retired, um, she appears to still have access. And number three, granted that access, she does appear to have medications and medications that are mood and mind altering in, in, in her home. So um, no, no discrete evidence, but we're gonna keep this in our differential nonetheless. Um, we would do the same type of thought exercise with regard to an underlying medical condition. Uh, is there discrete evidence that Annie Wilkes suffers from a general medical condition? Again, no. Uh, and then the same question, are we therefore reassured? And unlike substance use, we, we, we reviewed this before, this really has to, uh, I think, be guided by two risk factors with regard to medical conditions uh, that are not part of the chart, so to speak, not part of the script. And we would treat patients the same way. If a patient tells us that there uh, is no past medical history, um, we're reassured if they're young and if they're female, okay. at, least, at least for test-taking purposes, right? When the labs come back normal in your clinical vignette, when a patient reports no past medical history, when the physical examination findings are benign in the clinical vignette, we can say that this appears to be normal health on an exam. The same exact clinical vignette in an older male, you should not be reassured. And Annie appears to be a hybrid, right? She's intermediate. She has one protective factor. She's a woman. And she has one risk factor. She is older. So intermediates are going to stay on a differential diagnosis. And maybe they're towards the bottom of the list. But certainly, many of us would still at least do a lab workup as well as a comprehensive physical exam. And then finally, we have to investigate this condition of bipolar. If we do, if we're going down this algorithm thinking that she might be depressed, we have to make sure that her depressive episode is not in the context of a larger disorder. And initially, the history um, could inquire about a manic episode at any time in her life, because if that is the case, um, this is a completely different condition with a different prognosis and treatment plan. Right, different course prognosis and treatment plan called bipolar, right? And for mania, bipolar one. So um, that's where we are with regard to Annie Wilkes now investigating the likelihood that this may be bipolar illness. Uh, any, any evidence in the film to support this? I would say it's more of like a bipolar, if it were a bipolar picture, it would be probably be more of a bipolar two picture. Um, I feel like with the irritability, the outbursts, the decreased sleep, I don't know that it necessarily, I think it's more hypomanic than manic. Um, I don't know what people's thoughts are. Well, um, well we'll get, let, let's get to that differentiation, <laughs> differentiation a little later. Um, that, that is next, but I first want to focus on manic symptoms. And and again, remember for clinical purposes, manic symptoms at any point in the individual's life, unfortunately, um, we don't get the benefit of pausing this movie and asking Annie uh, that past psychiatric history the way we would a patient. Zach, you want to say something? Oh, well, more differentiating bipolar one and two we can do later, so we can save. A little bit, a um, couple, couple of minutes away. So first, for those Stephen King fans out there that want to stay muted because you don't want to expose yourself, um, you do know that there is a Netflix series called Castle Rock, um, season two of which provides us the origin story of Annie Wilkes. And it is established in the Castle Rock series that she is manic. So if we were to ask Annie if there's any consistency with regard to the story arc, she would tell us. Um, I mean, assuming that she is going to be reliable, that yes, uh, she has had a manic episode um, in her past. And there is a past psychiatric history significant for mania, including an inpatient psychiatric hospitalization as well. Okay, so that's, that's pulling from another uh, medium, which is a little bit unfair, uh, but it is there. It, it, it is there. 
Um, but in the absence of that, if we want to just stay true to the book slash film, um, we have to focus on what we see. Uh, do we see anything that might might actually or they may actually be construed or formulated as manic symptoms? Um, she says some grandiose comments like, I'm your number one fan. Think of me as your inspiration throughout the film. Yep. Uh, that, that is a little concerning. Definitely grandiose. She definitely seems like she wants to, to get a lot of things done. She's like constantly getting getting stuff to, to improve his medical care and seems like she has high energy. Let's just leave it at that. Increase in goal directed activity as well. Sure. We said irritability already. The other, the other thing, while it's not a discrete criterion in the diagnosis of bipolar is that she's delusional too. And up to 50% of individuals with bipolar demonstrate psychosis. So that might also support that this may be a, um, a bipolar spectrum disorder that is a bipolar or related disorder. Uh, and while there is such thing as major depressive disorder with psychotic features, the incidence of that is actually much lower than the 40 to 50% seen in bipolar illness. So there is evidence here that, that actually may be a bipolar or related disorder. So let's talk about these related disorders. So um, PGY1s, what defines bipolar 1? Presence of a manic episode. Perfect. It's, just, it's as simple as that. And again, that's the way I, I really hope you communicate it to our medical students. The presence of a manic episode gives you bipolar one. Um, we, we always have to rule out the direct and physiologic effects of a substance and medical condition. And if we see signs of mania that are induced by either of those, then we're not dealing with a manic episode. So the way the question is phrased, um, the presence of a manic episode, a truly manic episode, there really could only be one illness, and that's bipolar one, with a caveat. Uh, that, that is, there's one very rare, less than 1% exception. What is the only, only illness for which the individual may have a manic episode but not be diagnosed with bipolar one? Uh, is it schizoaffective bipolar type? That's it. It's the only illness published in the DSM, the only illness identified by the American Psychiatric Association where a person could have experienced mania but will not be diagnosed with bipolar 1 disorder. That's exactly right. And again, the, the, the point incidence of schizoaffective disorder of bipolar type is less than 1% of the U.S. population. So it's rare. It is rare. Bipolar up to about 3%. All right. So, um, I think we're pretty firm um, on the idea of bipolar one. Remember, and again, it, it's just restating the same thing, albeit a little differently. You do not need the episode of mania to alternate with episodes of depression to rule in bipolar one. Matter of fact, approximately what percentage of individuals with a manic episode never become depressed? The current literature says one in five, up to one in five in individuals between 10 and 20 percent um, is uh, or uh, are in a situation where they, in fact, have a single manic episode that define their bipolar one, 10 to 20 percent, not one in five. Okay. Um, how does, general, in general terms, what is the definition of bipolar two? TGY ones. TGY twos. You have to have a hypomanic and depressive episode. Exactly right. All right. So bipolar two is defined not by mania, but by hypomania, and hy hypomanic episodes must alternate with episodes of major depressive disorder. If they don't, we don't call it bipolar two. We call it simply a hypomanic episode. All right. Uh, next question then, 
uh, since I think we all have what major depressive disorder is, and we have that down, uh, what is hypomania? And I think more specifically, how does a clinician differentiate hypomania from mania? TGY1s. Uh, so the episode requiring hospitalization. Uh, defines which one? Uh, manic episode. That's true. Hypomania usually lasts for about four days and you're still able to function um, in your everyday life versus mania, you aren't really able to function and it's usually seven days. Yep, that's right. So th there is one qualitative and one quantitative uh, criteria with regard to differentiating these two conditions. Uh, quantitatively, the magic number is seven. If the signs and symptoms last for seven days or more, we're going to call it mania. If they are less than seven days, it is hypomania. Right? And the DSM, just to lend another layer of specificity, at least four days, but no more than seven. Additionally, there's a qualitative difference. That is, in mania, the individual has impaired functioning, and then hypomania, functioning is not impaired. And it's only one of two conditions in the DSM that is defined by the absence of functional impairment. So those are the two differences. One is quantitative, one is qualitative, differentiating mania, less than seven days, no functional impairment from uh, mania, uh, hypomania from mania, which is seven days or more with functional impairment. What is the only illness other than hypomania in the DSM that is defined through not being functionally impairing? Is it mild? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. All right. Uh, no, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Daniel. I was going to say mild neurocognitive impairment, right? Okay. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> mild neurocognitive disorder is differentiated from major neurocognitive disorder, previously known as dementia, by the same exact criteria. And that, those are the only two in the DSM. All right. So, do we have any evidence that this is mania versus hypomania? Yes. The intensity is too high for this to be a, a hypomanic episode. She's stalking this guy, plotting how to find him, captures him, basically tortures him. That's way too intense to be hypomanic. It, it's it's going to be hard to argue against that uh, and that this is not functionally impairing. That's a tough argument to make here. And it also looks like it goes well beyond the seven days as well. Um, the average manic episode, at least in Kaplan and Sadoc, is about three months untreated, right? And we also we also say that people end up in the hospital or in jail, and she would hundred percent end up in jail. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point, and I don't think any one of us would think this, but it's probably good to review this with medical students, you know, because we tend, uh, especially earlier in our careers to focus on the way things are worded, especially in texts like the DSM, where you know we're focused on that magic um, number of seven. And if the individual goes into the hospital day two, well, that's not seven, but um, you know, there, there's a qualifier that if the patient is hospitalized, um, then the time course is off the table. If, if the severity is such that they're hospitalized or in jail because of the behavior, um, we don't care about the number. Um, it is reasonable to assume that if they weren't hospitalized, for instance, that it would have gone well beyond the seven days and probably around that three month window that we would expect per the medical literature. That's a good point. All right, so it looks like, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, just to jump in really quickly. I think also just the presence of psychotic features also pushes it to bipolar one. Um, so, yeah. yeah, again, unless you could really convince me that somehow her having bipolar features isn't clinically significant. That's a tough one. That's a good point. That's a real tough one. All right. So it looks like Annie Wilkes is struggling with a manic episode. And unless we think she's schizoaffective, um, it looks like bipolar one illness might be our single best answer. Um, at this point in our, our mental algorithm, um, we usually have to briefly pause and run through another thought exercise. If you hypothetically took notes on this movie and through this whole conversation for the first 30 minutes, 
you've been crossing everything off your notes page that we've been mentioning in our discussion and formulation of bipolar one illness. As you look down at your notes page now, would there be anything left? Is there anything in this movie you've seen that is not explained by bipolar one? Because if the answer is yes, we have uh, further case formulation. Um, we have to consider secondary and perhaps even tertiary diagnoses to explain that behavior. So I just wanted to, I guess I wanted to just add in one thing. I think we were speaking a little bit last time about just some of the antisocial quote unquote tendencies. Um, so probably like personality disorders, I think are interesting um, because it's like difficult to diagnose and you have to kind of, you know, maybe spend some time with the patient to, to sort of parse it out. Um, also in the context of other illnesses. So I guess if we are trying to diagnose an additional personality disorder in any Wilts, Theoretically, would be like if she was in the hospital, of course, we would stabilize her on medication um, for a manic episode. And then maybe after a while, after a few days, once she starts to become more stable, it would, you know, continuing interviews, we would probably be able to parse that out a little more. Just like the, some of the core, core features of antisocial um, personality disorder, for example, and then we can sort of see to, to see if she like meets that criteria as well. I guess that's the only additional thought that I would have. Like, just like what underlying personality disorders would we be able to diagnose in addition to um, a primary mood disorder? Yes, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, so, again, not to put words in your mouth, but it, it does appear that uh, Annie Wilkes demonstrates a blatant disregard for and violation of others' rights, which is the cardinal trait of the antisocial personality. And we even have this reinforced when Paul escapes his room and comes across that scrapbook where it's revealed that um, her father died mysteriously and there were several infant deaths for which she was brought to trial. And she even makes reference uh, about being on the stand in Denver. So um, it's hard to dismiss that. Now, um, to your point, uh, all of that is due to a manic episode until proven otherwise. And we can prove otherwise either retrospectively or longitudinally. Um, what you described was going longitudinally. Let's treat the um, acute condition. Let's put her on a mood stabilizer. Let's uh, follow her closely. And when we can document that there is no longer any grandiosity or impulsivity or any of those signs that would define mania, uh, does that cardinal trait persist? Because if the answer is yes, we're likely dealing with another illness. That is, that cardinal trait, that blatant disregard, cannot be attributed to the mania. Um, on the other hand, which I think would be more difficult, is to go back um, retrospectively and tease away timelines with regard to her behavior. That is, during, the, during those times where she was killing those infants, does she, or maybe even more importantly, collateral inf informants of fellow nurses report uh, any manic signs? Because if they continue to tell us during those months between blank and blank, Annie had um, linear, coherent speech. She demonstrated no flight of ideas. Uh, there was no other goal-directed activity other than the crime. She did not appear to be distractible, uh, et cetera. Then uh, we similarly can say, well, then none of that behavior was in the context of mania and therefore was not due to bipolar one. So, retrospectively or longitudinally. Either way, we would do that. I agree. That, that history of Annie Wilkes is so compelling of who she is that it's hard to dismiss it. I think we would have to look at it on our, on our notes page and treatment plan how we would go about ruling it in or ruling it out. Oh, I just have a question. Thank you. So throughout the or there's one scene in the film where I guess Paul is escaping the room and she notices that the penguin is like placed the opposite way. So she knows that's how he escaped. And so my question is like in terms of obsessive compulsive disorder versus like goal orientation, because that seems like kind of neurotic to know exactly where the penguin is placed. So and then in terms of the novel too, like she was very specific, like the novel needed to end this way. Like, how do you differentiate it being a goal oriented activity versus like an obsessive compulsive disorder? Yeah, I, um, again, very similar to that scrapbook 
Um, the penguin facing due south is a major scene and even a major tagline in this movie that really doesn't allow us to just ignore it. Um, so I would I would certainly think that there might be an obsessive compulsive personality component to this. And I think, again, we would tease that out the exact same way. Um, people who are acutely manic are usually distractible. Um, and I would think that her observation about that penguin is certainly not consistent with that. And there might be an underlying personality disorder to explain her perfectionism. Uh, and oh, by the way, it does then if, if we adopt that, it certainly begins to explain her need to be in total control all the time, too. Uh, so, um, I, yeah, I agree. Uh, OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality, I think would be on our notes page. And I'm not so comfortable that everything we explained that went into our case formulation about mania and therefore bipolar one um, uh, would account for that penguin needing to face due south and her picking up on it. No, I agree. Now, the other part of this too, do, do these two observations that the residents made merge in any way? Um, what if we do believe that this cardinal trait of be, having a blatant disregard for and violation of others' rights is real and is an independent characteristic from bipolar and similarly, her obsessive compulsive personality traits are also revealed to be distinct from bipolar. Can they merge some way? We know that one is cluster B, one is cluster C, um, but might there be behaviors that these two observations explain? Sorry, Dr. Toby, I just want to make sure I understand the question right. Could you rephrase it? Um, you're, you're saying that she has both cluster B and cluster C traits. Was that the question, or maybe I misunderstood? Well, I'm assu let's assume that she does. I'm, I'm taking us through a scenario where this group agrees that both both sets of personality traits are not going to be attributable to bipolar, and therefore might lend to two additional diagnoses and probably two ad additional formerly known as access two pathologies. That said. Uh, even though they are two distinct illnesses, right? One cluster B, one cluster C. Is there a situation that these two may actually merge and explain those traits? The other way to say this is what type of person they present to you um, demonstrating a blatant disregard for um, and violation of others' rights in addition to um, requiring per perfection. Oh. Gotcha. A, a serial killer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a psychopath. Right? That's an absolute psychopath with the precision, premeditation. And when we begin to look at this story, that actually begins to shape up for Annie. Uh, somebody mentioned it before. I think it was it Zach about her having stalked him. This was all planned and premeditated, uh, perhaps prior to her manic episode, of course. Um, where she stalked him and she sabotaged that road. Remember, in the beginning of this movie, you know, we're, we're kind of just settling in, nice warm night, watching a friendly nurse do her thing. And, you know, this car goes off the road. And here is Annie Wilkes with regard to that expansive acreage in the middle of a blizzard, just so happening to be where that car goes off the road with the proper equipment to be able to get Paul Sheldon out, right? The likelihood, right? If you want to, if you want to look at this from a, the scientific method, uh, that occurring by chance alone is zilch, right? This was all this was all planned, right? She knew when he would, she knew when he was going to be in that lodge. I'm not really sure how. She knew when he was going to leave, and she made sure she sabotaged that road. And she had to know almost to the minute when he was leaving because if she sabotaged that road. Hours prior, how many other people could have died? So um, she knew exactly when he left and when that road needed to be sabotaged. And therefore, she was in that right place at the right time in the middle of a blizzard. Right. So combining the aspects of total perfectionism and need for control with 
blatant disregard for others' rights gives you the psychopath. So now we need to go back to Castle Rock season two and watch to see if there's any evidence of Annie Wilkes prior to the age of 15 having evidence of conduct disorder, because that would buy us the antisocial personality disorder. Um, and if she doesn't, we're going to not diagnose her with an illness, but instead probably adopt the clinical term of psychopath. If all of this bears out, of course. All right, very quick on treatments. I know this is not a psychopharm course per se, but very quick on treatments. Uh, three modalities here. Um, antipsychotics um, have been reinvented as mood stabilizers. Everybody, I think, is very familiar with these. Uh, the atypicals in particular are now routinely prescribed for bipolar illness, um, both for the acute manic episode uh, as well as acute depressive episodes within bipolar as well as maintenance therapy, that is, when the individual is between episodes. Um, similarly, the anti-epileptic drugs, or AEDs, have been reclassified as mood stabilizers as well. Uh, the most commonly prescribed here is valproic acid. And then finally, you have lithium, uh, which initially was classified as a quote-unquote anti-manic agent, a little bit of a misnomer, uh, certainly can be used in treatment, uh, or I should say, um, bipolar depression, albeit not FDA approved, it is part of the APA treatment guidelines with regard to its usefulness, as well as maintenance therapy as well. Again, maintaining somebody on the medication in between episodes. Uh, for any particular episode, the likelihood of a future mood episode, aka recurrence in bipolar, is more than 90%, greater than 90%. So um, clinicians should never discuss tapering or stopping the medication to see if your patient is in that top five or 10%. That would be very dangerous. And the only time that conversation would ever happen would be when there is a planned pregnancy. And um, we're discussing uh, the teratogenic potential and the risks and benefits of both continuing as well as discontinuing the mood stabilizer. Uh, that said, um, there when we actually discover that scrapbook i think i think in the movie it's called memory lane scrapbook um we see a quick picture of her that is uh, annie years prior this is when she was a nurse um going to trial and you know quickly we note that she she's gaining a lot of weight and although uh, and i could break the news to you guys right now when you approach 60 folks um you might just be a little heavier than you are today so um that's coming and that's 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 the bad news. Uh, but you know, in Annie's case, and certainly for us to take some creative liberty, uh, maybe this is medication-induced weight gain. And um, unfortunately, if we want to kind of get an idea of what medication Annie Wilkes may be on, um, the weight gain really doesn't help us at all because individuals can gain weight on uh, the atypical antipsychotics the anti-epileptic drugs, um, with the exception of lamictal, and um, even lithium. So um, still doesn't really focus on or narrow our scope on what might be, be being prescribed for Annie. Um, there is one thing, uh, and we I think I discussed this with the TGY2s before, so if you heard this before, uh, please stay muted and let the TGY1s uh, have this discussion. Uh, but there is one fatal flaw in this movie. There's one scene that I think of Stephen King could be consulted on and um, um, recommend editing out, he would. Any Anybody know what scene I'm discussing? We have about five minutes left for this conspiracy theory. Anybody here Stephen King fan? It's not that I'm not a fan, but I would just say, I would more argue it as, um, I feel like I like his non-horror stuff the best, which is probably, you know, like, like you know, so, um, but I'm not, like, I've never read his actual books, but I've seen the movies, which sounds and, terrible. And, I, and I'd say I've read some of them, but not enough to qualify. Right, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Can, can you guys, can you guys kind of um, tell me what, 
King's one of King's major motifs is? What is he known for? Oh, didn't you say like um like the ideal town or something and then basically some some twist on the ideal American value or American town or something like that? Exactly right. All right. Yeah, King is notorious for creating this idyllic village town um, and then revealing what what sinister entity people lie beneath. Uh, as soon as we actually get down to some detail with regard to the people who are part of this town, um, that facade uh, melts away to our horror. Uh, and you know, he he uses these settings to create this mismatch and how what we're seeing is beautiful, but um, of course, at another level, what we see and what we experience, and as much as we identify with these characters, is just horrifying. That's vintage Stephen King, and he does the same thing here. I mean, remember the conversation Buster has at the beginning of this movie when um, the character portrayed by Lauren Bacall, Paul Sheldon's agent. Um, calls because he's missing, right? Um, anybody recall paraphrase Buster's conversation? The agent asks to speak to the sheriff, and he said, well, that's me. And I, again, I'm going to paraphrase because I actually don't remember exactly what he says, but it's along the lines of if you're looking for the city clerk, the notary, uh, and the guest agent attendant, well, that's me too. Uh, that is vintage Stephen King. Uh, because only moments after that do we meet one of this perfect idyllic town's inhabitants and residents, and that's Annie Wilkes. And all of a sudden, we've got this just blatant mismatch of this beautiful facade and what lurks beneath. So with, with that, as a clear backdrop, there is a scene here that just doesn't fit this idyllic town. What, what is in this movie that an idyllic town of like just Stephen King vintage wouldn't have? When she forces Paul Sheldon to rewrite Misery and bring Misery Chastain back to life, upon completion of that manuscript, what do the two do? They have, they have a dinner. They have a like celebratory dinner. What's part of that celebratory dinner? Wine. Oh. Well, more specific. Champagne. Champagne. Oh my god! Wait, it was champagne. What am I talking about? It wasn't wine. Yeah, that was. She, they needed like a glass of champagne. Yeah. So she comes in with a bottle. Anybody? Anybody? I mean, again, remember? Again, per Stephen King, not me. Per Stephen King, he has a very specific champagne that he buys here. Not very honest. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody here ever buy a bottle of Dom before? Do you, you think this town has a $250 bottle of Dom Perignon sitting around? No way. And again, Stephen King would tell you that. Again, if, if we the caught movie... him. Oh my God. We... <laughs> I said we caught him right there. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. There's only, there's really only a couple of ways, both conspiracy theories, and I'll share one with you now. The other one is a tease. You'll have, we'll have to talk later. But the one conspiracy theory I want to deep dive in in the, in the couple of minutes we have left is the idea that Annie Wilkes had to leave town to buy that champagne. And while she could have just went up to Denver, um, it does make sense that she probably came out to our area because she was stalking Paul. She had to have known when Paul was going to go to that lodge. And while she could have called the lodge, you know, that may have been a little suspicious. Um, because she kind of knew she was going to do what she was going to do. So she probably would not go up to Liddy and say, by the way, when's Paul coming in? She probably learned it from Paul himself by stalking him. And we know she stalks him, right? We even know that they met before because when he does leave the room on one occasion, in the background, we, we, take a click, we have a quick glimpse of a signed autograph picture. So... It's very reasonable that she was out in our area, Paul's from Manhattan, stalking him. If that's the case, what might happen to Annie when she buys the Dom Perignon and she gets back to her 
um, small town that is a mile high in altitude. For those of you who have rotated through medicine before or already, what might happen is somebody when they travel from New York to a place in Colorado that's a mile high above sea level. Like mountain sickness, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What is the treatment for mountain sickness? Acetazolamide. Acetazolamide. <laughs> Why does a psychiatrist know about acetazolamide other than the fact that they have to rotate two months through internal medicine? Uh, one. I'm sorry. I said step one. Fine, step one. Why else? Acetazolamide is uh, among the list of medications known in Iraq with lithium. What happens when somebody who is taking lithium takes acetylzolamide? And by the way, any Wilkes having been a nurse would have known to take acetylzolamide for her symptoms upon returning from New York. And what happens if she's taking lithium and now takes acetylzolamide? It, it decreases, right? The lithium level decreases. Yeah. Right. Acetazolamide or Diamox is part of the acronym could C O U L D that decreases lithium levels and therefore certainly provides a risk, significant risk for people like Annie Wilkes to experience a manic episode because of her being undertreated, undermanaged. Now, again, her background is in pediatrics, not psychiatry. So while she, um, or you know, general internal medicine, while she would have known about acetylzolamide, it is not likely she would have known about that medication's interaction with lithium. So um, from, from our perspective, the one gaff in this movie about that Dom Perignon somehow showing up at Annie's little farmhouse um, can be kind of justified or smoothed over with the uh, recognition that she likely left the area to buy it because she left the area to stalk Paul. And upon returning, mountain sickness would have been treated with acetylzolamide, that's Diamox, and what was euthymia resulted in acute mania, resulting in what happens to Paul, that is the plot of misery, right? Uh, by the way, just a closing comment with literally less than 120 seconds to go. Um, C-O-U-L-D. Um, with regard to what may reduce or lower lithium levels. C is caffeine or similarly structured medications like aminopalin. OU are osmotic urinary agents. OU, osmotic urinary agents. L is Lasix and D is Diamox. The opposite of could is can't, C-A-N-T. Those are four medications that can increase lithium levels and result in lithium toxicity. C are calcium channel blockers. A is ACE inhibitor, N, NSAIDs, and T, thiazide diuretics, right? Could and can't. Hey, one more time. Wh which one you need, uh, Zach? Can't. Can't. Can't are uh, three antihypertensives. C, calcium channel, uh, channel antagonists. A is ACE inhibitor. N, well, N is NSAIDs. That's not antihypertensive, sorry. NSAIDs. And T, thiazides. Can't. All right, and that ends our discussion on what else. Any walks? Any, any final questions? All right, guys. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.